So in this service, we're going to continue on, though, because I believe there's a word of the Lord for this particular service and for you. Are you ready for a word? Amen. Amen. Stand with me, and we're going to read from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 5, and we're going to go deep. Is that okay for a minute? I'm going to do a little preaching, a little little teaching, and a little prophesying in this service. I just feel like God is up to something in this house in a powerful way. And God is up to something big in your life in a powerful way. Amen? In fact, get your prophetic bone and finger out and tell somebody beside you and say, God is up to something big. Come on, tap somebody in front of you and tell them God is up to something big. And then turn around back on them and say, yeah, God is up to something big. Amen? I was going to preach on the book of Ruth. You're going to have to do it next week. I just really feel like, actually, I I skipped two other sermons to go to this one. I really feel like God has a word for us in this time. Amen? So we're going to go to the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we're going to chapter 5, and it says, ready, read with me. And I saw, wait, stop for a second. God's about to open up your eyes to begin to see things in the Spirit like you've never seen before. Can somebody say, open the eyes of my heart, Lord? Okay, ready? And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll. Somebody say a scroll. Somebody say it's all about the scroll. If you want to know what I'm preaching on, I'm preaching about a scroll here today. It's all about a scroll. Ready? Who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with the... Doesn't that sound like a military angel right there? Does that sound like this is an army angel right here? A strong angel with a loud voice. What did he say? Who is worthy to open what? The scroll. Somebody say the scroll. What are we preaching on? The scroll. It's all about the... Okay, ready? Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one... Somebody say no one. What do we say? No, nothing else. No one else. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open what? The what? It's all about the, is open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much. John was crying because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open what? To open what? The scroll and to loose its seven seals. Watch this. Watch this. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures. And in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. Then he came and took what? He took what? Come on, somebody say, it's all about the scroll out of the right hand of him who... Let's pray. Lord, help us to see. Open up our eyes. Open up our ears. We want to receive everything that you have for us on this day in Jesus' name. And somebody said, amen. Amen. Be seated. Be seated. How many know Jesus is the answer? He's the answer. For the world today, above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the one. There's a story I told in the first service. I want to tell you there was a story of a little girl. She asked her daddy. She said, Daddy, I want to to learn the states of the United States of America. And so he said, okay. And so he got this magazine, pulled out this picture of the United States of America, and he cut out all the states. And he said, okay, I want you to learn. So I'm going to lay it down here on the table, and I want you to put it back together how you think it might go. And so she started in, and about three minutes later, she comes back, and she says, I'm done. And he's like, what? And so he looks, and it's completely perfect. And he said, how did you do this? You didn't know this. And she said, well, on the back side of the paper was a picture of Jesus. 
And I figured when I put Jesus back together, then the country will be put back together too. Oh, somebody's going to catch this here. We need Jesus. Can somebody say Jesus? Um, uh, uh, Pastor uh, Alexander and Chrissy's son, Daniel, he's two. And uh, this yesterday, he got, I got a text, a video text of him. And he, he, he comes on the text and he says, he calls me Uncle Pat. He said, Uncle Pat is funny. And then someone's voice, I don't know who particular who it was talking in the room, but it was definitely of the female persuasion, <laughs> said, is Uncle Pat, is he, is he funny or does he look funny? And he said, he looks funny. I was like, kids say the darndest things. And then this last week, Daniel, he's, he's hilarious. He, he, they put him to bed, right, every single night with the sound machine. Anyone ever use a sound machine for yourself? Okay, and uh, rain or ocean or, you know, different, different rainforests. And so you put it on and it makes this white noise and you go to sleep. Well, he, he's a two-year-old. How many know twos are wonderful? We're speaking those things that are not as though they already are. And, and, and so twos are wonderful in Jesus' name. And so, and so he, he, he looks at the sound machine. They're about to turn it on. He goes, no! He said no to the sound machine. He says, I want Jesus. And I was like, there is a child who has his priorities straight. Come on, somebody say, I want Jesus. Well, today we're going to talk about the subject of all subjects. And I'm going to talk about a subject in the middle of the subject. And I'm talking about worship. I'm going to talk about a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And, and we're talking about the subject of worship. When we look at the Bible, we realize that every part of the Bible is about worship. And how many like to worship? It's amazing because when you learn how to worship through every storm and every season when it's good, when it's bad, when you're on the mountain, when you're in the valley, when it's raining, when it's drought, you learn how to worship. Something powerful takes place. Worshipers are not contingent on seasons or circumstances or situations. If you are a worshiper, you are a worshiper. And you've learned to worship God through it all. Come on, somebody. You've learned to trust in Jesus through it all. You've learned how to, to rely on him through it all. And you've learned how to give him glory in the fire, in the lion's den, when the enemies are trying to rise up against you. Through it all, you send Judah first. You, you praise first. You say the Lord is good and his mercies endure forever. And you got a testimony that when you praise the Lord, that the Lord set ambushments against the enemy and the enemy turned on itself. Can somebody say, yeah. See, when you learn how to praise God, when you learn how to worship God, it becomes part of your everyday life and you worship him in spirit and in truth and you realize that worship is not just singing songs. And going through the motions and the calisthenics of church. But worship is a lifestyle. Worship is not a music style. Oh, I'm getting in somebody's business here. Well, I like it how they do it over here. They're very acoustic driven over here. Well, I like it over here. They play the organ and they go to church over here. And they got the choir rocking back. Worship's not a music style. Worship is a lifestyle. Where all of a sudden I realize worship is not my obligation, it's my occupation. It's what I was born to do. I was created to worship. Can somebody say, yeah. And so you look in scripture and you realize that, 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 that there was a whole company of people that were designated. They were designed to worship and that's what they were, were, were made to do. And that was the angels. And we realized that angels and, and, and seraphim and cherubim, they cry holy. And, and that's what they were created to do. And that's a good kind of worship. But there's another kind of worship that God's looking for. And it's not a worship based on designation or creation. It's a worship that's based on choice. And God created a, 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 a company of people, a, a, a creation called man, who he gave this thing called choice. I'm warm up here. I feel like preaching here in a second. And he created mankind to worship him. Because he didn't just want to have angels. He didn't want robots. He didn't want uh, just AI 
But he wanted flesh and blood to make a choice where they stand up and say, I will worship. And you look in Scripture. Let me break something down here. We look in the Old Testament. We realize that worship it's in the Old Testament is done from afar. It's done from afar. You look at the, the tabernacle and the temple system, you realize that it's a sacrificial blood atonement system uh, because you have this institution where God is worshipped from afar. Why is God worshipped from afar? Because of this thing called sin. Can somebody say sin? Can somebody say, say sin sucks the life right out of you? Okay, good. I'm just checking to see if anybody's... And in the Old Testament, there was a worship system that was in place, but there was this thing called a veil. And the veil was a thing that separated man from God. But when you get into the New Testament, because of the intervention of God through the one named Jesus who is the Lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world, all of a sudden our rights were returned to us in worship. And when Jesus laid down his life and said, it is finished, can I preach the gospel? All of a sudden, that separation, that middle wall of partition, that veil that was between us and him was rent in two. It was torn in half, and now we've been given, watch this, a word called access. You see, in worship, we have in the New Testament, we've been given access. Sometimes we can take it lightly. We don't understand that in the former days, there was a system and there was no access but now we've been given access, and, and we could take it for granted. Like, like in John chapter 12, when, when, when the woman with the alabaster box, which I preached on last service, she busted open her alabaster box, and, and, and Jesus is in the room. What do you do when Jesus is in the room? You had these people who were religious standing there looking at Jesus, and then you have these disciples who had been with Jesus for three and a half years, and they're used to Jesus. One thing we have to be careful is, it's to not take what God has given us for granted. Oh, I'm talking to somebody here. God has given you life. He's given you joy. He's given you peace. He's given you hope. He's turned your life around. And it's easy sometimes to just take things for granted. And here are the disciples representing a company of people who are taking Jesus for granted. But here you have this woman and, and, and she has access to his feet. And what does she do? She breaks open her box. And she releases an unmistakable fragrance into the room. And the glory filled the room with her worship. And, 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 and she, she, she began to wash Jesus' feet with her tears. Tears represent an emotional release. You realize that when you cry, right here in the front of your brain, there's a release that takes place in your emotions. And her emotions were being released at his feet. And then she dried his feet with her hair. And the hair in Scripture speaks of the glory of oneself. So she released her emotions. She broke open this fragrance. And she took her glory and she wiped his feet. She had access. Can somebody say access? And so you realize in the New Testament, there's this thing called access. Because here's what happens. True worshipers, those are the ones the fathers seek, who worship in spirit and truth, do not want to worship from afar. True worshipers value presence. True worshipers want to be in his presence. And they've learned that when praises go up, Woo! God inhabits the praises of his people. He sits down as king on the throne before his people. And his presence comes. And in his presence, there's fullness of joy. And so true worshipers understand this. But if we don't have a revelation of what we have in worship and what we're doing in worship, and what worship is, then we're going to continue to worship from a distance. It's amazing. We can be in one worship service, and one person's... Getting their praise on, 
and right next to them. <laughs> the next person is bored out of their mind. One is worshiping close. The one right beside them is worshiping from afar. Yeah, I'll clap. Pastor said clap. He said, raise your hand. My grandma used to say this. When you raise your hands, raise your hands high. Because if you raise your hands at half mast, that means somebody's dead. But Jesus is alive. So somebody just wave your hands in the air. See, when we don't have an understanding of what singing does, of what prayer does, of what clapping does, of what dancing before the Lord does, of shouting does, if we don't have an understanding of, 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 of all these things then in worship, then we're not going to value or appreciate nor practice nor participate in what's going on. We're just going to go through the motions. But in the New Testament, we have access, and there is a way into the most holy place, and it's by worship. Can somebody say, by worship? And so here's what I want to talk about today. There's a type of worship, and if you're writing down the notes, this is titled, A Reason to Worship. There's a type of worship that is based on the revelation of redemption. Oh, this is good. Can I go deep on you for a minute? Can we do Bible college knowledge up in here? Can I do CTI, Karis Theological Institute? Because some people want to go deep in the word. And so, and so we realize there's a type of worship that is based on the revelation of redemption. Somebody say, I was created to worship. Did you look at the person beside you? Tell them you are created to worship. Come on, make an announcement for them. See, I, I want to share something that changed my life. Can I do that? Yeah. And I, it might change somebody else's life. In Revelation chapter 5, it's all about the scroll. It's all about the scroll. When we look at the scroll, we realize that it's in his right hand in verse 1. It's in his right hand. And when we look, we realize that there is a revelation of redemption. And so in the book of, how many like the book of Revelation? How many understand the book of Revelation from from Wow, you're amazing. It's an apocalyptic book. It was written by the, 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 the John, the beloved, the apostle John. Um, he wrote his, his, his gospel, the gospel of John, and then his three epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then he also wrote uh, the apocalyptic book, Revelation. He wrote those five books. The first four books he wrote in Ephesus. And then the last book he wrote in an aisle called Patmos. And Patmos means my suffering. How many would like to visit my, uh, Patmos? All right, we're taking, right now, we're going to do a cruise to Patmos. Does anyone want to sign up for Patmos? It's only $9.99. Food is included, shows, everything. Bingo every night on the cruise. Nobody wants to go to my suffering. But John gets his greatest revelation in a place called my suffering. Wow, come on. And he's able to see what he could not see because he was in a place called my suffering. God began to open up the heavens before him in Revelation chapter 4, and he heard a voice that called him up higher, and he said, come up here, and I'm going to show you things that must take place after this in a place called my suffering. And does anyone want to go to my suffering yet? Uh, I, I don't think so. But you look in the book of Revelation, and you realize that it's all brought together, the whole book, chapters 1 through 4, and then on the other side of 5, all the other chapters to the very end are all centered around chapter 5. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand that the hinge of Revelation is chapter 5. Are you ready for this? Two people. Okay, good. And the first ingredient of chapter 5 is a thing called the scroll. Can somebody say the scroll? 
the scroll, and it's the focal point of the entire book. So let me break down Revelation chapter 1 through 3. Chapter 1 through 3, and I'm just going to do the first five. I'm not going to get to the whole book right now because it's a whole other subject. But 1 through 3 is about the church on earth. And then chapter 4 is about the throne in heaven, which leads us to this place of the scroll. We have to first understand woo, that God has a church. God chose the church. He chose the foolishness of the church. He chose the church to be his bride. And he said, I have a, a plan and I have a purpose and I have a people. And my people is the church. And so in Revelation chapter 1 through 3, there is a thing called the church on the earth. In Revelation chapter 4, there is a thing called the throne in heaven. And in Revelation chapter 5, it's all coming together. They work together. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. In earth, what? As it is in heaven. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? And so we realize then, then that, that in chapter 5, there's this sealed book. There's this sealed scroll. And somehow, the subject of the scroll shuts down the activity of heaven. Ooh, this is good. I, I, I feel like teaching here for a minute. It shuts down the activity because the scroll is a scroll of redemption. Can I build a case here for a second? Because I think this might change somebody's life. And it's not a scroll of revelation. Because if it was a scroll of revelation, that Jesus would be revealed as a prophet. If it was a scroll of creation, protology, he would be revealed as the creator. If it was a scroll of eschatology and things, then he would be revealed as this teacher. But no, it's a scroll of redemption. And redemption requires a different kind of person to step onto the scene. And so you look in, in this scripture, and it's a scroll that is not in the earth. It is in the heaven. And it is a scroll that is all of a sudden shuts down the activity of heaven. Heaven is buzzing. Heaven is moving. Heaven is active. Angels are crying, holy, holy, holy. There's this worship service that's going on all the time. And then the subject of the scroll comes up and everything shuts down. Everything closes down. And it's amazing in this because, because you see that nothing astonished and you read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. Nothing astonished the angels like this subject. And nothing astonished the prophets of the Old Testament like this subject. They looked into the grace and the salvation and the redemption that was wrought for us in Jesus, and they wondered and they said, whatever could this be? And, and, and so you look and you realize that there's a lot going on. But unfortunately, redemption, we don't understand it completely. We think redemption is about Jesus' birth, it's about his life, it's about his death, and it's about his resurrection, but there's actually more. There's more to the redemption story because you look back in the garden. Somebody say the garden. In Genesis chapter 3, and Adam and Eve, they what? They sinned. And what did God do? He did not destroy them. They actually did something. They sinned. They disobeyed God. And they did something that was worthy of their destruction. But right from the very beginning, God said, I'm going to put a proviso in this thing, and I'm going to give them redemption. And so they had a lack of revelation when they found themselves naked, and they were ashamed. And they've covered themselves with fig leaves. And God said, no, 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 that's not how it's going to work. I'm going to insert redemption in the middle of this story. I'm preaching the gospel here, by the way. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shed the blood of an animal and give you skin, first leather suit in history, and I'm going to cover you with something that has shed blood. As it says in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Can somebody say, yeah? And so you look in this scripture and you realize that God provided redemption from the beginning of time, and the blood 
became a mediator between fallen man and a holy God. Somebody say the blood. There's power in the blood. And when you look in the scripture, you realize throughout the Old Testament that they had this system that kept them afar from God. I'm talking about a reason to worship. And they had this system where they had to kill lambs and rams and goats and pigeons and animals and shed their blood so that their sins could be covered in the Old Testament. But I thank God that the book of Hebrews says that we've been given a better sacrifice. We've entered into a better covenant because we have a better Savior and His name is Jesus. And He's not just any old lamb. He's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Can somebody say yeah? Can I keep teaching here for a second? And so you realize, catch this. So you look in the Old Testament. Somebody say the Old Testament. They had an understanding of redemption. They had an understanding because you look and you realize that there were two types of redemption in the law. There was a proviso called the difficult times proviso or provision. And then there was what we call the nearest kinsman provision. And so what the distant, what will you look at this, 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 this idea, that, I'm sorry, this difficult times provision means, it basically means that if a family all of a sudden fell into hard times financially, had to sell the farm, the family would not lose the farm forever because there was a year put into the calendar of Israel called the year of Jubilee. He's teaching up in here. And in the year of Jubilee, everything that you lost in the 50 years God says, I'm going to return it back to you because I gave you a promise. You see, at the dividing of the land in the book of Joshua, you realize that each tribe was given land. And within each land that the tribes had, each family was given land in those tribe areas. And so each one was given, watch this, an inheritance that was perpetual. And so you might lose it because you had to sell the farm, but the year of Jubilee, the difficult time provision, the year of Jubilee comes along, and all of a sudden what you lost in the former is now restored back to you, and it's therefore called the year of Jubilee. Can somebody say difficult times? The second provision, this is why Israel understood, and John understood what he's talking about here. In the second provision there was a thing called the nearest kinsman. Can I teach? Can you give me like... And the nearest kinsman is basically this. Somehow, either by poverty or death, someone loses their land. And when they lose their land, they don't need to wait for the entire time if there is a kinsman how many know we kinfolk? Sister Sledge says, we are family. And so, and so you look and you realize if there's a family member who has the means, who is competent enough to be able to take you out of your debt, your foreclosure, they can come along at any given time and buy back what you have lost. Oh, somebody's going to catch this here. And so in this, in, in, in this idea, it's called the law of the Goel. Somebody say Goel. It's G-O-E-L. It means kinsman redeemer. The law of the kinsman redeemer. And it's demonstrated in Ruth. I'm going to preach that next week. In Ruth chapter 3, where Naomi and Elimelech had to sell their land because of famine. And because of famine, they lost everything. And when Naomi and Ruth went back to Bethlehem, there was a man named Boaz. See, some ladies are looking for their Boaz. I'm not preaching what Jensen preached. Like broke as and, you know, all those people. And Poaz. And you better watch yo as and all that stuff. All that stuff. See, I'm not preaching that. That's another preacher. Don't get religious on me now. I said as, A-Z.
Boaz bought back what Elimelech and Naomi had lost in famine. And in the package deal, he got Ruth. And Ruth married Boaz, and they had a son named Obed, and Obed had a son named Jesse, and Jesse had a son named David, and eventually David had a son named Jesus. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Can I keep teaching? Is this okay? And so you realize then, you understand that there is this concept of redemption. There's automatic redemption, and then there's intermediary redemption. Automatic at the year of Jubilee, intermediary when the kinsman redeemer arrives. And so with this, and here's what I'm, gonna, here's what I'm building to, with, whenever a kinsman redeemer would come along, they would take two scrolls. One was an open scroll, and one was an old, a, a, a closed scroll. It was a sealed scroll. And the open scroll would be public record of what was happening. But a sealed scroll was a particular scroll that they used, and it was what we call, I want you to catch this, had the terms of redemption in it. It was sealed with the terms of redemption. It was what Jeremiah understood in chapter 32 when he was in prison, and the Lord told him, he said, by the field of your uncle's son, Hamamiel, in the place called Anathoth, and what I want you to do is I want you to take you the open seal, the open scroll, and I want you to take the sealed scroll, and I want you to put them in earthen vessels. That'll preach right there. I want you to put them in earthen vessels so they may last many days. Can I keep teaching? Can I keep teaching? And so there's this understanding that a sealed scroll, watch this, becomes the sign of a forfeited inheritance. A forfeited inheritance. And so when John wrote Revelation, not only did he understand this, but his readers, his Jewish readers understood that the Jews, they, when they connected this, they understood that the sealed in Revelation chapter 5 scroll was a forfeited inheritance. Oh, somebody's going to catch this. It's a forfeited inheritance. And so in Revelation 5, there's this sealed scroll. And in the Western mindset, in our mindset, when we hear the word sealed scroll, we think confidential. But when you look in the Eastern mindset, they don't think that way. We can't read the Bible through our Western mindset. We have to read the Bible through how they thought and what they understood and their revelation because the, the, the revelation that they understood when they heard sealed scroll is forfeited inheritance. There's a forfeited inheritance that happened. Do you know what that forfeited inheritance happened? Was it, It's like the story of a young couple. They got married. And when they got married, they saved up enough money and they bought a house. And that house was theirs and the banks. And it was theirs and it was the banks. But nonetheless, they got qualified because they had enough money to be able to pay the mortgage. Does anyone follow in what I'm saying? And so one day, the, the dude was driving home and he, as he was driving home, he looked over at the car lot and there was the brand new 2025 F-150 King Ranch with that leather, that new leather. And he went in and he just said, I'm just going to go ahead and go on there. I'm going to take a look at it. And he was taking a look at it. And the, the car salesman comes out and he's talking real slick. Now, if there's any car salesman's room, it's not you, but talking real slick. And, and then he, he, somehow he talks him into not just looking at it, but actually test driving it. And then he test drives it and then he drives it off the lot and he buys it but he doesn't have enough money for it. And so after a while, they're trying to make it. It's a struggle every month, pay the mortgage for the house, pay the mortgage for the car. And then finally, it's easier to pay the mortgage for the car. And so they got to a place where they lost their house. Well, somebody's going to catch this. And so you realize at that point when they lost everything that, by the way, the salesman is the devil. The car salesman is the devil. He talked them out of their inheritance, the house. And you look and you realize that, the, that, that, that God came 
And he gave the title deed of earth to man, the house. He gave it to us and through sin and a lack of obedience. I'm almost done, don't worry. And the lack of obedience, Adam and Eve lost the keys to the house because they're trying to drive the car. And they're trying to ride a ride, and so the devil sells them the car, and they succumb to the temptation. And what happens is, is the title deed for the house is not Satan's. See, i got to make an announcement for somebody who has some kind of theology that the earth is Satan's. No, no, no. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So when Adam and Eve lost the title deed, God took it and he held it in his hand until Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. This is good teaching right here. This is a different kind of sermon, but this is good teaching right here. I'm going to sit down and take notes myself. Ha! Ha! And so, and so you look in this and you realize that in Revelation chapter 5, there's, you, you look and, and, and it says, here, here's how we know it's not the devil. The devil's not in charge. This is not a runaway train. He's not taking this thing. God is on the throne. He rules over all. I got, I got to make an announcement for somebody here. And so, and so, so, so Revelation chapter 5 verse 3, this, this, this soldier, strong angel with a loud voice asks a question who is worthy to open the sealed scroll the forfeited inheritance and take a look at it what are the rules the terms of redemption and it says in that verse no one in heaven no one on earth no one under the earth, no angel, Woo. no person, no demon, no Lucifer is able. And all of a sudden, you look in the scripture, and what happens? John begins to weep. Are you with me? He begins to cry. He begins to get this revelation. There's no one worthy to open this thing up. It's an unopened scroll of our forfeited inheritance. But then all of a sudden, the revelation of the kinsman redeemer begins to rise. And an angel speaks to him and says, yo, John, when an angel starts speaking to you like this, you better listen. Yo, John, don't cry. Ha, there's one named the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He has prevailed. I got an announcement for somebody up in here. When you did not know that you could receive redemption, there is one named the kinsman redeemer, and he has prevailed. He's worked on your behalf to open up what has been sealed in your life. And he begins to recover for you what has been stolen, what has been taken, and he opens the seal. Somebody say, Jesus, the lion, the root of David, the lamb has prevailed. The lion prevailed, but the lamb laid down his life. The lamb paid the price. Look in scripture. I double dog dare you to do a, a study. Lambs are always a symbol of redemption. And here Jesus is, woo, and he opens a scroll. And Gabriel and Michael and the seraphim and the cherubim and the elders and the living creatures and the beasts around the throne 
start up a party. Because there ain't no party. Like an around the throne party. Because an around the throne party don't stop. It, watch this, invoked worship. Understanding that there is one who took our forfeited inheritance and broke it open, invokes worship. Woo! When you're a place where you feel like you lost something, you move in petition, you move in intercession, but when you realize you've recovered something, you move to a place of praise and worship. You see, when you thought you lost something, you wail more than you worship. But when you realize you recovered something, I got an announcement to the church that you've recovered something, all of a sudden your worship changes. You see, we're stepping into an environment of recovery. I got to make an announcement because redemption is recovery. And God wants you to recover your mind and recover your family and recover your dream and recover your vision God wants you to move into a place of recovering everything that the enemy meant for evil because now he's turning it around for your good can somebody say yeah 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 Woo, he felt like preaching he turned that teaching to a preach right here And now we worship, not just because of, watch this, personal redemption. Somebody say personal redemption. How many know that Jesus personally died for you? How many know he died for your sins? And he died for my sins. And it's personal redemption. But he also (laughs) brought redemption so that what was lost, could be restored what was lost well you look in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10 and it says this I want you to catch this this is the last part he made us verse 9 he says he redeemed us and then verse 10 it says he made us kings and priests somebody say I'm royalty you are a royal priesthood you're a king and a queen. So many people walking around just, hey, Kang. What's up, queen? Do you know what? They have a revelation that they don't even understand what they're saying. They're speaking identity, but your identity of your royalty comes from his majesty on high. And so he says, he made us kings and priests. Priests have access. Woo. Kings have authority. Priests have access. Somebody say that. Kings have authority and priests have access. He made us kings and priests, watch this, to rule on earth. We have done the church a disservice by continually focusing on the sweet by and by. I had one amen. When we all get to heaven, what a glorious day that will be. And he's like, wait a second. You're on terra firma here now. I need you to learn to rule and reign now. In the nasty now and now. I'm going to make you a ruler in this place. How are you supposed to live in this life? Just wait until we all get to heaven. Let me just focus on eschatology all the time. Every single day, I'm just thinking about just when are we going to get out of here? When's the rapture? When is he going to snatch us out of here? Stop it. I'm going to tell them over here. Stop it. I'm, I'm preaching Bob Newhart who just passed away. Stop it. You are supposed to reign and rule in your atmosphere. We need to begin to teach about kings and priests. 
We need to teach about people who are going to rule and reign in Colleen, in Texas, in the United States of America. If God puts you here, how are you supposed to operate? He says, just operate, just waiting to get out of here. I'm just waiting to get out of here. Just waiting to get out. Come on, God. Kill me. Do something. Take me out. Do a personal rapture. Just take me. Just beat me up, Scotty. I know it took an extra couple minutes, but this is, this is, we need to understand this. Because what is your redemption for? Is your redemption for just salvation and you're, you got your ticket? Or is redemption for restoration of God's purpose in the earth. When I read my Bible, I look at it. I look at the church and I'm like, this is what's happening right now is not the way it's supposed to be. Where we're just moving from scandal to scandal. And I ain't pointing the finger at nobody, by the way. Because he that is without sin cast the first stone. So put your stones down. Drop, thud, 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 thud. Drop, 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 drop. That's not what it's about. But there's a certain point where we begin to overcome this life. And we begin to move in the power of God, in the purpose of God, in the destiny of God that he has obtained for us. What did the church, I, I'm, I'm closing this, because, because what did Paul tell the church in Philippi? He said, hey, yo, folks, I want to apprehend that for which I have been apprehended for. I want to get it all. Whew. I don't want to just live life and get to heaven and he says, half done. Or undone. Come on, somebody. But when you get to heaven, he's going to say, well done. My good and faithful servant enter into your rest redemption Woo! leads to restoration and restoration leads to demonstration and demonstration leads to rest did you catch this teaching up in here today so no more fear in Jesus name no more CNN and Fox and all this other spirits of the age that are moving around and we're moved by this I'm not moved by what I see I'm not moved by what I hear I'm not moved by the headlines oh come on somebody I'm not moved moved by deadlines I'm moved by Jesus my kinsman redeemer he took my forfeited inheritance and he paid the price with his blood on Calvary. See, I'm preaching the gospel here because there's some people in this room right now, you need to hear the gospel. I heard the Lord speak to me and he just said, Patrick, I want you to begin to weep over a company of people who don't know me. I want you to begin to cry out for them because there's a whole, there's cities, there's people groups who don't know him. And I can come in here and do, we can do our religious calisthenics. And I can, we can have worship and I can preach and we can shout and say amen and go out the door and stay the same. Or we could weep over people who are wounded and who are hurting, who need a savior. Come on, somebody. His name is Jesus.